What is up and welcome back to 24 Minutes of the Oscars, the podcast that takes a look at the 2024 Oscars 24 minutes at a time. I am Ethan Simi. And I'm Ben Lahorn. This week on the pod, we are writing our own story, yo, as we talk about American fiction. A novelist who's fed up with the establishment profiting from black entertainment uses a pen name to write a book that propels him into the heart of the hypocrisy and madness he claims to disdain. We are in best picture number seven. That means we only have three left after this until the Academy Awards, the biggest night in Hollywood, something that we've been looking forward to for many, many uh, too many months, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and I can't believe we're here. Of course, we have a wonderful guest joining us for this uh, episode and this movie. TJ Zwarich of Agents of Fandom is joining us to talk about American fiction. TJ, welcome to the pod, man. How's it going? Doing very well. Thank you so much for having me on. Very excited to talk about American fiction. It does feel a little like it's it's definitely not lost on me that we are three white dudes talking about a movie that is <laughs> I'm glad so you brought it up because it was prevent- next on the talking points here. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my apologies. <laughs> I should, shouldn't have gone. Uh, I uh, went a little ahead in the rundown, but I was just on that note, you know, I feel a little underqualified, but at the same time, this is such an incredible movie. I loved it so much. One of my favorite movies of the year. And so couldn't be more thrilled to talk about it and uh, re- excited to link up with you uh, with both of you. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it'll be good. Of course, like you mentioned, the irony is not lost on any of us. I don't think of uh, talking about American fiction um, and where we stand in that conversation. Um, but you know, we we recognize that, and we're just gonna we're we're just gonna tackle it like we tackle any other movie here uh, on the pod. Um, TJ, I want to start off. I know I mentioned that we're getting close to the Academy Awards. Uh, do you care about the Oscars? Is this something that you look forward to? How much of your personal sanity is invested into The Biggest Night in Hollywood? So I feel like I'm just kind of right in the pocket with this because I'm invested. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to watching. But I would say actually none of my sanity is invested in it. So like, <laughs> Lucky I, for like you. while I'm watching <laughs> this, is so like my other job, I have agents of fandom and then my other job is I work in fantasy sports. And so uh, I'm very much used to being very invested while the game's going on. And then if it doesn't go in my way, well, mm, on to tomorrow. Um, and so I'm going to be excited. I'm going to have my predictions. I'm going to watch. But then if they don't go my way, the very next day, I'll be ready to forget about it and move on. Wow. Must be nice. Must be nice to not live with Babylon haunting over your every <laughs> aching, aching week. A moment. year later. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, I'm a little jealous of you. Ben, you and I have invested way too much of ourselves into the Oscars and the Academy Awards. Of course, we we did this last year. We're doing this this year. We're only a few weeks away now. Check in, gut check. How are we doing the closer that we get? Um, and also, did you see the first ad for the Oscars came out today, the day we're recording? I did not see the ad. Uh, I did not watch the ad. I saw it getting shared plenty on Twitter, but I did not watch the ad. Um, Looks interesting, though. But I feel, as far as the Oscars go and what I want to win, I feel like basically Zendaya in all the Spider-Man movies. Like, if you expect (laughs) disappointment, you can't get disappointed. You know, I'm just like... (laughs) You know, past lives probably not going to win anything. You guys are bringing me down. Iron Claw already didn't get nominated. <laughs> so I'm just like, I don't know. It's fine. Oppenheimer is going to win everything. And all of you Oppen homies are just going to be like <laughs> talking about it nonstop. And I've just got to live with that. What can you do? Yeah. Well, at least you know it's coming. At least you're prepared. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. Um, yeah. I'm I'm excited the closer we get, obviously. Um, a little wrinkle into our Oscar plans. Of course, we're going to have an immediate post Oscars pod. Um, that'll be up the, the very night that the Oscars happen, giving all of our live reactions and things. And then, uh, several days after we're kind of, we're kind of going to have a, a little bit of a debrief and a deep dive into the, the Academy Awards. Um, I will be enjoying the Oscars from Austin, Texas. I'm going to South by Southwest actually for agents of fandom for the website that I write for. Um, so, that's really exciting, but Ben, that means that we are not watching the Oscars together this year. Unless so I surprise sad. you in Austin, who knows? You know, we'll see oh, what happens. Oh, we'll that could be a good time. Who there knows? you go, live pod <laughs> from Austin. Let's go. Um, okay, the Academy Awards are soon. They're coming up. Uh, TJ, how badly do you want something in particular to win? Is there one category or one movie that you really want to see? 
win something this year at the Oscars? So feels a little cliche to say, but as a big superhero fan, the one I'm pulling for the most of anything is into the, across the spider verse to win uh, best animated picture. Mm-hmm. Um, I am, I haven't actually seen the boy in the heron yet. That's one of the ones that I'm still very looking forward to seeing on my Oscar list. I'm not going to see everything that's nominated for anything, but there, there are quite a few that I'm still, um, are glaring omissions that I want to see before the Oscar is uh, boy in the heron is one past lives is another one. Um, but that would be my, my number one. I'm looking most forward to, you know, if, if Barbie can come away with anything, uh, I'm going to be thrilled. Anything that it comes away with, uh, even in like the, uh, kind of more secondary, like not that any of the categories are secondary, but if they have any, if they come out with anything, whether it be, um, some music original songs, you know, like I'm not Mm -hmm. expecting them to come best picture, but any of those types of categories uh, I'll be looking forward to. And then the one, the race, like one of the ones I'm looking the most forward to just seeing who wins is, is visual effects, because I think there are so many great nominees in that one, the creator Godzilla minus one guardians of the galaxy three mission impossible. Um, I haven't seen Napoleon, but those other four, I'm very curious to see how that plays out. Yeah. Yeah, It's going to be interesting because it's like, Napoleon is kind of a reserved, subtle VFX, and then you have can, stuff like Mission can I Impossible say and now Guardians. Yeah, that I think I think Napoleon's gonna win. Oh, okay. Okay. VFX. Yeah, yeah. I but, want any of them, but that one, <laughs> dude. Think about the Academy and Ridley and pulling off a historical epic of that scale. Just throwing it out there. Just something, something worth worth noting. It's possible. Uh, yeah. Ben, who 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 are you going for in, in VFX? Now that we're now that we're talking about this, I'm curious. I, I mean, it's hard for me not to want to go with Guardians just because that's, you know, one of my favorite of the MCU. So um, that's the thing. That's what I'd be pulling for. It's what I want to win for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I am pretty torn on, on Best VFX, to be honest, because I think the creator did have some of the best VFX and, and sure. not only the best, but the most intriguing VFX of the year, especially like being shot on location and then folding in VFX on top of that and how they made the film is so intriguing. I just, that movie's not good. In my opinion, I did not like that film. And so like, if I have to be like, yeah, Oscar winner, the creator, I don't know how I'm going to feel about that. Um, it's like Oscar winner, suicide squad. Yeah. I would love, <laughs> I would love if it was Godzilla minus one, because I think that would set That's like good. a really great standard Mm -hmm. uh going forward because they're Mm -hmm. kind of known as a movie that they had a smaller budget and with their budget what they did was they invested it in a ton of it into the well-being of their vfx creators they had office set up with food and snacks and everybody was allowed to leave at 6 p.m or whatever it was and if you wanted to stay later you could and it was a welcoming environment with all the things you could need but you never had to and um, I think it would set kind of a really good standard of how VFX artists can be treated going forward. If it's say, "Hey, look, we want an art, uh, we want an Oscar doing it the right way without actually spending that much money." Yeah, do it this way. Especially mm-hmm. after everything we've heard in the industry with the VFX artists, that'd be that'd be huge for them to win. Yeah, that that would be a good one. Um, I'm really curious here before we dive into American fiction and and its Oscar pre- um, chances and and predictions i'm with you on godzilla minus one i think that would be an excellent precedent for the academy to to set um not only for that world but like for the recognition of more international features i think is always a good thing obviously um i'm curious because you brought this up tj and we're actually not, we're not going to cover it here on the on the pod because there was no animated film nominated for best picture but it is a conversation worth having in, in my opinion, at least briefly, um, since it kind of got brought up. So you mentioned Spider-Man across the spider verse is what you're pulling for, for best animated. We've got elemental, the boy in the heron robot dreams and Nimona are going to be the other nominees. Ben, I'm, I'm curious. Do you have someone you want to win best animated? Do you think something's going to win best animated? Where are you in this category? I had a really good time with Nimona. Like I thought that was a lot of fun, but I don't, I can't imagine what they'll give it to outside of Spider-Verse other than Boy in the Heron, just because it's Miyazaki, you know, like I could totally see that happening. I haven't seen that either. So I can't com- like comment on how well it's done, but you haven't, haven't seen, seen other- Boy in the Heron either. 
No, but having oh. seen the other Ghibli movies, like I'm sure it's fantastic. Sure. But there's something to the intensity of, you know, Spider-Verse that I think deserves some respect as well. Yeah. I I think I'm a little bit more torn than you guys because I, I've seen everything except Elemental, actually, in this category. Um, Robot Dreams, for some strange godforsaken reason, is not being released by Neon until May 31st of 2024, oh, wow. which I, I just... I'm a little bit flabbergasted that that's that's happening. Um, luckily, I was able to snag a screener and see that. Um, I recommend everybody check that out when it comes out in the summer and when the Oscars are over and all the Academy Awards hype has died for that mm-hmm. film, um, which, again, just absolutely astounding decision. Um, I, I, I feel like it's just going to be a bit more of a toss-up between Spider-Verse and The Boy and the Heron because it is Miyazaki and we're, and we're living in this year where so many auteurs have come forth and basically said like this might be it this might be the end for me yeah. and and i might not make another movie of course miyazaki is rumored to still be making another film after this um this for a long time was um kind of his last film as far as people were aware um across the spider verse is in a pickle in my opinion because it's a second installment of what is going to be a trilogy. And if, if history is, is any, you know, serves any guidance here being the second is, it is a tough, I know the Godfather part two won best picture. And I know that there's, there's anomalies, but like when you look at, you know, the return of the King, that was, that was it. The Academy was like, let's save it all. Let's, yeah. let's just, let's put it on the third. Right. So I think you see the Spider-Man, um, across the Spider Verse and then beyond the Spider Verse, I think if the Academy is as smart as I want to believe that they are, they'll have some serious discussions about this and think how do we plan this out and how and how should we see this? Because more likely than not, whatever year we're getting beyond the Spider Verse, we are not also going to be getting a Miyazaki film um, and things of that stature. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's very we- interesting. Could just like with all the announcements that like Disney's been doing for Pixar that could line up with like a Toy Story 5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do agree with you. I think Beyond the Spider-Verse will be when they get their flowers, especially when you consider how that movie ended and it being like such a hard cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. I think it deserves such strong consideration because in terms of the way it was animated, it might be the best animated comma movie ever. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of how it was done, but uh, with the story is very much not done yet. It's very much just waiting for the next one to come out. So I, I 100% could see Beyond the Spider Verse being the movie that gets its flowers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a tough one. Um, I still shout out Robot Dreams for even getting nominated. I think is is incredible. Um, okay, let's talk about American Fiction. That's the movie we're here to talk about today. Nominated for five Oscars. Before we dive into this, really. I am curious how you guys feel. This kind of felt like the year where like a few movies got a lot of nominations. I know there's there's some outliers, of course, and we're, and we're actually going to talk about a couple of them today in the best original score category and some movies I got one or two nominations. But I mean, we're talking about movies like Oppenheimer and Poor Things and American Fiction and all these other films that got 11, 10, 8 five nominations how do we are we okay with that like are, are we good with just being like here's the six movies that we're going to give 80 percent of our nominations to i mean i feel like some of these movies that got it deserve it you know i mean mm-hmm. we, we talked about that as as we were predicting before they made the announcements but with barbie killers oppenheimer it's just like yeah, yeah. the production design's great the sound's great the writing's great like they just have so much going for them so it's, I guess you can't really call them all monopolies, but there are a lot of juggernauts or whatever this year, so to yeah. speak. So, um, and you know, one that kind of sits above the rest of them. So yeah, it it's, it's interesting. I do think that's where, you know, possibly some new categories help introduce some other movies and we'll see if that happens down the road. Yeah. Um, but the way it's, you know, laid out right now, it's just it, that that'll happen sometimes. Um, TJ, any, any thoughts? 
Yeah, I, the additional categories thing in the future was the same point I was going to make as a way to uh, solve that a little bit. And I don't have any good specific examples off the top of my head, but it'd be great to see more often if even there was one movie that was nowhere near a complete masterpiece enough to get nominated for Best Picture, but they did one thing really, really well. It'd be cool to see more often those squeak in there than yeah. I think they currently do. Um, and I mean, I'm still a... I would have loved to see Greta Gerwig get get in there for for best director too. But then again, that still doesn't change what you were saying. It'd still be, well, now Barbie is also dominating like these other ones are. Um, and so uh, nothing, I would like to maybe see some more inclusion across the board, but I don't think I necessarily have the right uh, tools to fix it. Yeah, I don't know if the Academy has the right tools to fix it either. Um, and I don't know if that speaks more to the Academy or more to the year in cinema that we had, which I think are both interesting like juxtapositions of, of one another because the Academy can never really do right, it seems. Like if they're they're kind of like um unfortunately, you know, just kind of like beholden to either a wonderful year in cinema and they give all the nominees certain things, or um, they just choose to go all in on certain things regardless. Um, you guys mentioned a new category. This is not something that we've talked about on the pod yet because news just came out, I think, last week about this, and this is the first time we're recording since this news came out. But beginning in 2026, the Academy Awards will include a new award and category of nominees for Best Casting. We should dissect this for just a brief moment because this is a big deal. Um, it's the first new category in quite some time. I think people have been calling for a new category for a very, very long time now. Uh, it is, it is not best stunts, which I think we're all kind of on the same page about like, let's, let's do best stunts. Maybe this is the gateway to get us there. Um, yeah. but, but regardless, best casting, I'm curious what made them come to this decision because it feels like Oppenheimer and Barbie put pressure on on people to be like yo we got to recognize some of these casting directors because they're fucking pulling it together for some of these movies right yeah without a doubt i mean some of these films were fantastic this year and it'd be really interesting to see what five would be nominated for this year but that's I a think great question run it right now what five would it? get nominated right now well it's it's oppenheimer and barbie for sure yeah without a doubt what are the other three for casting though i think that's very I think it's interesting because we have no metrics. We don't know how this is going to be mm -hmm. nominated or anything. Yeah. I, some I, I, across, across the, the spider some killers of the flower moon stuff, maybe with a little Gladstone. Um, but the other thing I was like, the first thing I thought of when, if they're bringing this in, they should almost do a retroactive, uh, like not life to, like lifetime achievement. Isn't the right way mm -hmm. of doing it, but just like a, pioneers award right off the oh, bat for, for Sarah Finn on this one, because who has just cast the entirety of the MCU mm. um, because she is probably the most integral person to the largest film franchise enterprise ever behind Kevin Feige. Yeah. She is the one who picked Robert Downey Jr. Who picked all of these perfect, like wonderful, wonderful castings. There's, there's as many, many great and, realistic criticism there are of the mcu one of the few things you never ever hear criticized is the casting yeah. um and so that I, I i would love to see her get some kind of some kind of recognition because it's almost hard to get in there now because so many people are like aren't aren't new at this point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think if you go five this year i think you go oppie barbie i think across the spider-verse could be a very interesting pick in this in this category for sure, uh, with the voice cast that it does have. Um, Asteroid City, I think, also gets in there this year. Um, and then that fifth spot is feels like kind of a toss up. Probably Killers of the Flower Moon, just because of how how layered and and nuanced the cast is. But I don't know. I don't think I don't think Across the Spider Verse gets in there. I think that's where Iron Claw gets its its nomination. Mm, interesting. Well, that's what I was going to ask because I I agree with that too. But like a lot of the stuff, while the, it is all great casting, that was also like the most casting. You know, those like twenty roles in all those movies. Whereas Iron Claw feels like it's mm. like six roles. So does that help that movie? Like that they went six for six on the casting in that, 
or is it better that, you know, Oppie went 15 for 20 on middle-aged white dudes? You know what I mean? Like what's the better casting? It's hard to say. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what they end up doing. It's fair. It's fair. I, I feel like this could have been where air squeaked in this year. If I'm going to be honest with you. Air did not get any Oscar nomination. I think that's a crime. I don't know where it would have fit, but it's a crime regardless. American Fiction got five nominations. Best Picture, Best Actor for Jeffrey Wright, Best Supporting Actor for Sterling K. Brown, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Original Score. TJ, I'll start with you. Do you think it has a shot to win any of these categories? I, I don't for Best Picture. Um, I don't for best actor. I would love for Sterling K. Brown to have a shot in uh, a supporting role because I think he was so great, but this was just a wildly difficult year to win that. I think, I think that's Mm -hmm. pretty much like a shoe in for Robert Downey Jr. At this point. Mm -hmm. Um, but like best adapted screenplay would be great or would be great if there weren't so many others that fit that category as well. If they would have categorized that one differently, obviously Barbie was shooting for a best original and if Oppenheimer wasn't in that one this year, but it's fitting all the same things that Oppenheimer are gonna, is almost a, a shoe in to win. Um, and so that's where I'm kind of struggling to see it winning. Best original score would maybe be my most likely one for it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think it's got a tough slate ahead. Uh, ben, do you see it winning anything? I don't know that I see it winning anything, but I agree with TJ that the score is its best chance. Um, I'm glad to see it in adapted screenplay. This is Cord Jefferson's first feature film. Uh, mm-hmm. He's written on shows that I'm familiar with, you know, Master of None, Good Place. He won the Emmy for Watchmen, for writing on Watchmen, which is pretty, that was a fantastic TV show. Um, but yeah, being his first feature film, it's a, you know, what an honor to get nominated for an Oscar right off the bat. But I just think that category is way too stacked. Uh, so I think score is the best option, but then even then it's just like, I don't know that it has much of a chance in, in anything, unfortunately. You mentioned this is Court Jefferson's directorial debut. I, again, like new categories. I mean, BAFTAs does this. So many other small awards bodies do this. A best feature, a best first feature, um, or a best, you know, like rising star kind of a thing, I think would be really integral for kind of the next generation of Academy Awards. I think if you're looking kind of long picture, I think, the, or big picture, um, it would be important to include something like that. Um, yeah, look, it it's not going to win anything. Uh, I hate to break it to to you guys and to anybody that thinks it might win something, but it's it's I don't think it's going to. I, I we're gonna get into this later with the best original score, but I I find it really interesting that it even got nominated for this because I'm not saying the score is not good. The score is good, but like, is it an Oscar worthy score? I don't know. I don't know. We'll put a pin in that uh, and we'll circle back. But I just don't. I don't really know how it got into that category and I don't know how half of the things that are in that category got into that category. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just going to get bodied in every other category that it's in. Um, and unfortunately that's by Oppenheimer. Like, so, I mean, you talk about juggernauts, that's it. That's, uh, I mean, Oppenheimer market correct in American fiction was a swift blow. And just said, you know what, not not this year. That's that's how I think things are going to shake out. So I don't really think it has a shot to win anything per se. Um, I all, I do think it's wonderful that Jeffrey Wright is getting nominated for for a Best Actor um, award. He is, you know, it was kind of a big year for guys that like have always been around but have never been the leads. Of course, mm-hmm. Killian Murphy being a huge member of that club, Jeffrey Wright leading that as well. And so, like, to see both of them get nominations, I think, is a really important thing. Um, are you guys ready to talk about talk about the movie, talk about American Fiction? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Obviously, full spoilers ahead for American Fiction. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, um, we're, we're going to spoil it. Um, okay, so this movie, and of course, the Academy loves a movie about either movies or people writing books and movies. And this falls directly into that category. Unless Um, it's May, December. (laughs) Yeah. Unless it's May, December, which I think is a little too 
complex and damning for their own good. Um, and I think, you know, I think mission achieved there for Todd Haynes and crew. But yeah, RIP May, December. God, talk about movies that should have been nominated for lots of things. Um <laughs> Okay, first thing I have on the list here is uh, Monk, who is played by Jeffrey Wright, is forced to uh, take a break from work. Um, and then immediately after getting this news, he goes to a book reading of this exceptionally famous author in this world, uh, Centara Golden, and her book reading. Um, I thought this was a really funny introduction to basically be like, D just a down on your luck kind of guy. That's just like things are just not panning out for our boy monk uh, here. And he has to leave his job and then listen to other people um, basically read their books that contain zero substance. Um, and which is something he's, he's, you know, suggestively been fighting for, for his whole life. Uh, pr a pretty solid intro to the movie. I thought it was a great intro, uh, especially just from that classroom scene where the students like, Hey, uh, it's a little offensive that the N words on the board. I don't want to stare at it the whole time. And he's just like, you know, I'll do respect. I got over it. I think you should get over it <laughs> yeah. too. You know, like it was a great way to get to know our character and just how little bullshit he's willing to put up with. Um, I thought that was fantastic. And then yeah, Issa Rae's performance reading the book and then you mm -hmm. see it all in Jeffrey Wright's face. Like, Oh my God, this is, this is what people want. Like it's, uh, it's really interesting. He, he gives a wonderful performance and, we just get to know him right away, which I think is fantastic. One of the parts with it that I found so interesting with that exactly like word on the screen that you were talking about is it reminded me so much of, and something that this movie does so well throughout the entirety is pointing out the irony. That's such a prevalent part of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something I've noticed for like for five years of teaching when, a, when an, a parent will say like, don't you think like these kids are too young to be learning about this kind of thing? And it's like, well, with all due respect, if kids around the world are young enough to be subjected to racism, then I think your kid, M M Miss Miss White Lady, is is allowed to learn about it. Yeah, because they're experiencing it. Um, and so it, like that was one of those things that it pointed out to me, and I thought it was a really great opening scene and. Ethan, this is something you and I talked about really quickly before you went to see this movie, but as there are very few people in this in industry whose like opinion on film I respect more than yours, but you and I could not have more different tastes in movies for the most part. For the most part. Like I love giving you a hard time over how much <laughs> I hate um I'm power of the dog, the power of the dog. How I think that's <laughs> such just a bad horrific, take. Unbelievable. It's a horrifically horrific terrible, take. bad movie. <laughs> <That's> Anyways, <unbelievable. laughs> Anyways. You tell that to Jane Campion, TJ. You tell that to her. <laughs> uh, anyways, this is, is when I think air is another one of those types of movies where it's the two of our tastes kind of combining right in the middle. Um, and I really enjoyed this movie and it was a perfectly hard hitting start. I, I realized that I did jump the gun a little bit here and I didn't ask for like broad thoughts on the film because um, I feel like I have different feelings on this film than you guys might. Um, so even though we've done the first true cinema, Ben, did, did you like this movie as a whole or like where are you on it as a, as a, as a whole project? Yeah, I thought it was great. I thought it was very well written. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll get into stuff, but I wanted more Tracy Ellis Ross. Uh, mm -hmm. I was maybe surprised that Sterling K Brown got nominated for this. Not that he was bad, but just like maybe the amount of screen time, you know, compared to like some other stuff that we saw this year. Uh, but he was wonderful in as well. Jeffrey Wright, aside from commissioner Gordon, he's always great. I love God, Jeffrey Wright, you know, um, first TJ with the bad take. Now you with the bad take <laughs> fucking, you got to stop guys. You uh, have to stop. So it was fun to, to see him. Um, I could listen to him talk about anything. So, yeah. um, but yeah, I thought this was very well written and like TJ mentioned, like such a great commentary on the irony in society with this kind of stuff. Like some of my favorite moments in this movie have to do with that. So yeah, I, I had a really good time with it. And TJ, you liked this movie as well? Yeah, I liked it as well. There were some parts that I kind of felt like this wasn't for me uh, type of, and a lot of things that I also could have used more of, but I thought it was very well done. Like I thought it was a very well made film. Yeah, I think this movie is good, not great. Um, I I have now seen all 10 Best Picture nominees. This was the last one that I was waiting to see. I've rewatched most of them. Um, 
and this is my least favorite out of the out of the ten bunch. Um, I'm not saying it's not a good movie. I think it is perfectly good. Uh, I just I, I think the more that I think about it, or if I'm like drawn back to it, I think I land where you guys are, but just more harshly of like I would have liked more of certain things and less of other things. Mm. I felt like the this like the splitting kind of narrative to Monk's character of like his his book prospects and like what he's doing with that split with his basically self-identification in his family and everything with his mom and his brother Sterling K. Brown and all of these other things kind of over on the other side. I felt like that split was pretty tonally harsh for me. Um, and so like, it just felt like we we're like going from one like one objective to the next and then back to the other one and then back to the other one. And I just like, didn't feel that flow that I really wanted to feel in that. Of course, maybe on a rewatch that changes a little bit, but I feel like I'm probably just a little bit more harsh on it than you guys are. Um, I still think it's, it's, it's a damn impressive uh, directorial debut. I think there's a lot of uh, good moments in this movie for sure. And and we'll talk about them. Um, But yeah, I, I, I thought it was good. Um, Okay, next one, one thing on. specifically with that heavy tone shift that I want to touch on quick because I'm watching this show for the first time right now is it kind of reminds me a little bit of The Bear where there's mm-hmm. a, lo- a lot of p- parts with The Bear that you're watching it and it's like this is this is some really high quality stuff but I'm also very uncomfortable watching it and that's kind of how I felt about that tonal shift in American fiction of it n- wasn't necessarily a smooth transition but it kind of felt like it was trying to portray that this is not a smooth transition going on for monk right now. Mm. That's fair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next I have on the list is that Lisa dies. Um, Ben, you said you wanted more Tracy Ellis Ross and you did not get her because she, she surprisingly dies pretty early on in the movie. Yeah. I mean, it's effective for (laughs) sure, but it's like, man, 20 minutes in, it's just like, Bam. Oh, okay. This is what we got going on. But this did like, it did lead to one of my favorite parts of the whole movie where yeah. the dude, you know, walks by like, do you guys have a permit <laughs> for permit this? Are these human remains? It's like, <laughs> shut the fuck up, Phil. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, I really, I thought that was great. <laughs> um, and obviously our introduction to Sterling K. Brown in that scene. Um, but yeah, I mean, just a, a gut punch and just kind of like a, okay, wait, where are we going from here? Because, you know, they're talking about the, um, their mother and how well she is or isn't doing. And so you just kind of assume that's going to be the story. It's like, okay, they're going to be taking care of the mom and all that kind of stuff. And then suddenly one of the siblings is just gone. It's like, Oh shit, this is, this is a, a lot different now. So um, yeah, I thought it was super effective. Like a Pokemon move, super effective. And I <laughs> agree. There's a specific part with a specific character a little later on in the movie that I could have used a lot more of. Um, and so I kind of want to save my longer monologue for that one, but I agree with everything Ben just said. Yeah, I do think it leads to one of the funniest interactions of, of the entire movie. Um, and I, you know, I I like and I appreciate how Corey Jefferson uses kind of that, that beach as like that's the emotional core of not only Monk, but those around him and, and in his life and the, the, the best of times and the worst of times happen right there on, on that stretch of sand. Um, I thought, I thought was a, a neat visual to kind of harken back to. Um, yeah, she, she kind of dies out of nowhere, which, you know, I, to TJ, to your point, I think like is the point. Um, I think like this, um, kind of absolute shock that monk is going through and then it only like the the floor falls out and he just like goes down even even more is is a lot but yeah i think it would have been nice to get more tracy ellis ross in the movie i think like um that she was good like her her energy with jeffrey wright was was excellent and i i would have loved to watch more of that uh next on the list here i have monk writing so this is basically occurs after Monk has has kind of moved back into his his mother's home um, to kind of take care of her, he's trying to figure out where he lands on on this new world and this new spectrum of like what is a best selling novel, what is a best selling book anymore, uh, and he basically decides to kind of unlock his inner um, like 
hood and his his blackness and really open that up and take advantage of that and really kind of follow in the footsteps of of Centara Golden uh, and her best selling book. I thought this was an incredibly nifty visual narrative that we get mm-hmm. here with him writing and we get it acted out right in front of him. We get to break that fourth wall with him occasionally where the characters ask him like, what are you supposed to write next? Yeah. Uh, and I thought this was a hyper engaging part of the movie that I really, really enjoyed. Hyper engaging part of the movie that I also really enjoyed, but I thought it was so well contrasted with, Sterling K. Brown's character, and that's one of the reasons I think he like he fit a nomination even with such minimal screen time, is he's kind of actively saying to Monk like, just because your version of blackness is so quote unquote politically correct and it looks a certain way doesn't mean, um, and this is kind of the part of the movie that I like don't feel necessarily qualified to talk about, but I thought it was such an interesting contrast how. Monk is criticizing how the whole landscape of media and these higher ups are looking at and quote unquote trying to sell and uh, monetize the black story, the black experience, whereas he doesn't necessarily fit that. But at the same time, his kind of shucking of that and pushing away of that kind of says a lot about flaws that he has as well. Um, and so I thought the contrast was incredible and the way they portrayed like that fourth wall breaking, um, writing experience was really cool too. Yeah. Uh, wonderful scene. Keith David, I'm always here for him. He was fantastic. The other actor was fantastic as well. I don't know who he is, but Keith David was wonderful. Uh, that is someone who like taken the screenwriting classes and stuff. Like it was interesting to see that because there are moments where you're just like, have to tap into the character. It's like, what would this person say in this situation? Like you got to kind of step into those shoes. So it was just so interesting to see it like portrayed on screen that way, where it's just a character saying like, all right, what do, what do you want me to say? Like, what what's my line here kind of thing. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I thought this was so well done. I think it's a really fascinating um, kind of like a homage and like recognition and, and I guess like parallel to, um, like the black exploitation movement of the of the seventies, and like where that falls in culture now, and how we're kind of coming back to uh, maybe not something as um, ordained as that, but but definitely like a micro genre that uh, feels that it's needed uh, in in this kind of way. Um, and I think the movie obviously has a lot of really great and interesting commentary on that, and like who who can tell those stories and who should tell those stories and why should those stories be told, told in the first place. Um, I think that the movie navigates that very, very smartly and very well. Um, of course, not something I think any of us are really uh, remotely qualified to like speak at length on, um, but definitely not something that, that is like unnoticed in this film. Um, next one I have on the list is, the alcohol metaphor. Now, I thought this was hilarious. I really enjoyed this alcohol metaphor. And basically, Monk's like publicist um, is able to sell the book for 750 grand, which like, shout out Monk for getting his bag. Yeah. Good for him. Um, and basically identifies it as like one brand has like three different levels of liquor, right? You have like a certain, you have like um, certain standards and they all cost different things and they all offer different things to different people. And it's okay to fill those needs. And just because you fill one doesn't mean you can't fill another, which I thought was a really, again, smart, but like fascinating metaphor, not only for Monk and like the things that this movie pertains to, but also like, in the creative field, like in general, right? And like, and figuring out how to navigate that and and what to create and not create and produce and not produce and things like that, um, I think is really interesting. Um, and I, you know, I as a as a man who generally goes with the bottom shelf liquor, I I appreciate <laughs> the people who fill that void because I need it and I don't have a lot of money, so there's that. <laughs> Yeah, I think the point is made super well in the movie, just like because, you know, there is the most popular stuff that sells, but it doesn't mean it's the best stuff. It just means that's what people want um, and people need. And working in an industry, you know, doing video editing, like there are projects where I have two days to turn it around because it just needs to get done. Like we just need to like that's the whole content creation side. Like 
Mm-hmm. Let's just get it out there. Let's get it done. And then we have projects where we have like a month and a half to work on it. Cause it's gotta be perfect. Um, and you just, you give each of those things different kind of attention. And I think the alcohol analogy worked wonderfully. I couldn't agree more. And just keeping it in that same lens, it, it does apply to the stuff that we do, like with agents of fandom. I know there's, there's one specific article I wrote that I was really proud of it and just kind of the different comparisons and contrasts I was making. And it was a character study on how Wanda Maximoff and Anakin Skywalker have so many similarities. Um, and, and in terms of them being, you know, the chosen one in their own vein and succumbing to darkness um, and temptation with all of these different things, you know, like 50 people wrote that, read that, like 50 people read that article. I spent like hours and hours and hours like with, with this and like almost nobody read it. Um, but the people who did, like I had a few people reach out to me and be like, this was really cool. Um, and to me, that was like one of my like, you know, higher end things that's not going to be for everybody, but the, the, the people who enjoy it are the people who enjoy it. I still got to do my top five movies on Netflix this year, top five Marvel characters, top five this and this, things that Google likes, the things that everybody's searching, the things that are right there on the shelf that we got to be putting out in bulk because that's what sells. Um, so it kind of like, you can use that metaphor in so many different ways. And it, it was very eloquently put. Shout out John Ortiz for just being pre- honestly pretty stellar as, uh, as Jeffrey Wright's, uh, publicist in the, in this, uh, movie. He's, he's really funny. There's a moment where <laughs> I think it's later in the movie, but they're on a phone call again with, with some people they're trying to sell. I think they're trying to sell the movie rights, um, which is kind of like where we're going where the next point, but I, I think they're trying to like sell the movie rights and they, the people on the other end of the phone are just like chatting and talking and talking, and talking and John Ortiz just like motions like a gun to his head and like blows out his brains and of course, Monk's father committed suicide in his home um, via gun. And so, what he does immediately after that, where he's like, "Oh, sorry, 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 sorry," I thought it was incredibly funny. I, I thought it was exceptionally well played and yeah. and just just re- immaculately done from from both of them. Um, the next one on the list here is selling the book rights to then become a movie. He sells these rights to uh, Wiley, who is played by Adam Brody, which I thought was a great cast in, in this movie. Oh, so good. Um, for $4 million and calls it an Oscar Beatty issue movie, which again, like I think the meta nature of American fiction generally works for this movie. I think there are some aspects of, of it that don't work for me. This is definitely one of the ones that does work because uh, I think it can just be elevated to a much deeper conversation about like exactly what American fiction is trying to touch on with the Academy and with best picture and with Oscar Beatty issue movies. Um, I think it's a really, really interesting conversation that it brings to the forefront and, you know, money's money's an enticing driver in these situations. Um, and you know, he ends up selling, selling the movie four mil. Congratulations again. Get your bag. My guy. Such a funny scene too. the way it all plays out where he's worried about his mom. Who's across the street. And then here's the sirens and runs out. And then we find out later on why he's like, man, he's so real for that. He heard the cop sirens and he left. <laughs> he, you know, it's he just was like, out. All right, man. However you want to interpret it. I uh, thought that was, yeah. So it was great. Such a funny scene. It was a really enjoyable scene, and Adam Brody is probably one of my favorite underrated actors. You know, like he doesn't pop up with that that often, but when he does, it's a lot of fun. So I, I enjoyed that quite a bit as well. This is also the scene, and I wanted to ask you guys where we hear about um, Adam Brody's character Wiley. He's making a movie called Plantation Annihilation. Now. From what I could gather about this film, what he says is that Ryan Reynolds is going to get decapitated with an Afro pick in the opening scene. Would you go see Plantation Annihilation opening weekend? Not if it was made by Adam Brody's character. If this was like a, <laughs> yeah. if this was like a Jordan Peele movie, I'd be much more interested in looking at it as opposed to a, a, a Wiley movie. It, that this was a moment though where I enjoyed the meta-ness of it all because I yeah. believe Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively got married on the plantation and mm-hmm. like 
made an apology about it later on and stuff like that. So it was kind of funny that they called him out in this way and be like, Oh yeah, we're going to kill him right away in the opening <laughs> scene. like, and then he's, he also has to throw in like, he's a friend. You know? <laughs> like he's yeah. He's got to like throw that in there. But uh, yeah, I'm with TJ. If this is a Jordan Peele movie, sign me up. If this is a Adam Brody movie, I don't know. <laughs> I think any situation in which I can see society slash films uh, properly emulate the fact that Ryan Reynolds shouldn't be in anything really uh, is a good thing. And if he's dying right off the bat, I think that's a pro. So <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm with you guys. I'd probably be there opening weekend. Um, and you know what? The opening scene probably would be the best part of the movie. And then the rest, maybe not so much. Um, How dare you be smirch a Canadian icon <laughs> like that I'm, after we just got the wonderful Deadpool and Wolverine trailer. I know. Look, I liked that trailer. I'm so cold on the MCU, but I liked that trailer. But I think Ryan Reynolds is, that's a, that is a different podcast for another time. I think my man has to start making some better decisions in his life um next on the list is monk's book which is initially called um i can't i can't exactly remember the title that it is called but he changes the name of the title to fuck Mm -hmm. incredible stuff really honestly like i iconic um and he does it to piss off the people that are buying the rights and he thinks there's no way this will ever go through again, like exceptionally meta conversation about this and, and, and people's obsession with using black stories to generate certain clicks or engagement or whatever it may be changes the name of the book to fuck. This book then gets submitted to the literary awards in which he is a judge on. This is a late submission. And then this kind of takes over the third act, which again, I feel, I feel like we kind of strain in a lot of directions come the third act. And that might be part of the problem I have with the film. Um, but I think it's incredible that this move, that this book is nominated for the literary awards. And the fact that he named it fuck, I just like kudos. Like, I, I don't know. He just was on a big winning streak for a long time in this movie. Yeah. Like it, hilarious. Like, I mean, it wasn't initially, as he types it out on the screen, my pathology. Yeah. yeah and then he okay. changes my the pathology. TH to an S. So it's my pathology, <laughs> which, you know, the book representative is like, Oh, I love it. It's a great title. And then in an effort to call them on their bluff and just get this thing, you know, ended, you know, it's like, there's no way they're going to go for this. Which he was like, you guys have to call it fuck. And eventually they're just like, yeah, okay, cool. Do it. It's like, Oh my God. And a line he says <laughs> earlier in the movie is like, it's like the dumber I get, the richer I get. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of, you know, exemplary of that. So, uh, yeah, this was, again, Jeffrey Wright just doing a wonderful job. And just that scene with him and his publisher, just like, oh, my God, they really went for it. Uh, it's, yeah, very good. It's such a funny moment, too, when he just decides to go for it the first time. And he just, like, un- unmutes the phone and goes, what about fuck? It's <laughs> just like, yeah. it's, such a, it's such a great moment. Um, I agree that so my biggest issue with the movie was in the third act, actually, and when we get to the literary awards, and maybe again, this was like another meta commentary type of thing, because one of my favorite parts, one of my favorite like lines of dialogue and the whole thing is when the white author judges are saying to the black author judges, I think this one wins because we really need to listen to black voices right now, as the two black voices in the room are, are adamantly saying no this one does not deserve to win Mm -hmm. um and that to me was just like it summed up the irony of the whole movie of society so so perfectly of of performative uh what's the word i'm looking for um just being performative in general of doing things not for the betterment of society but so people (laughs) see you're trying to uh make society better and so I thought that part was really interesting, but I didn't need so much of those annoying judges just going back and forth about shit. And I didn't need so much emphasis on that. I could have used Issa Rae, and this is what I was talking about earlier. I could have used Issa Rae and Jeffrey Wright, have their two characters just discussing critical race theory and getting into the nitty gritty for 45 minutes instead of two. Mm -hmm. I needed that scene with them at the having lunch together at the table 
to last way longer and to have more of a resolution because I just feel like it wasn't tied up at all. And while the movie itself was not tied up in many ways and it was left up to interpretation in many ways, that to me was, and maybe this was just me as a white guy not knowing as much about certain topics as I should. So it actually felt very interesting to just have those educational conversations with these two very intelligent people who are on two total different perspectives. But that's to me what I found so interesting is you have two people who are clearly intelligent in their own fields, clearly know what they're doing, but have such polar opposite perspectives. Let's, I want to see them hash it out more. Mm -hmm. Whether they come to a middle ground or it turns into a fiery argument, I don't know which way it's going to go, but they both have such compelling points that I don't know which one is right. I don't know which one is more right. And I want to just see them bounce off each other more. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you. And I also disagree with you because I would have liked to see the same thing, but I want to believe that that is part of the metacritic nature of the film saying, if we give you 10 more minutes of this, it might not be a best picture nominee it might be too deep it might be Mm -hmm. too controversial it might be too this that and the other uh so i I think it says a lot in that scene both in what they say and what and what they don't say and the fact that we do move on Uh, but i agree i thought that was some of the strongest writing of the film took place when those two characters kind of kind of hashed it out um when um when they're selling the the movie rights i just wanted to pull up this this little fact for you guys um Michael Cyril Creighton, I believe is how you say his name, uh, plays Joe uh, Bosco or John Bosco in this in this movie. He is the guy on the other end of the phone that basically says, like, hey, we're looking to have it out by Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. Um, This character also plays someone in a wonderful flick named Spotlight. Not sure if you heard of it, but I think that they knew. And they knew the whole time, Ben. And it you happened. You know that I'm going to leave right now. And it happened. And it could have been you. And it could have been me. It could have been anybody. But they knew. Oh. And they let it happen. I can't anyway, believe you I th- found a way to make that. Connection. I thought that was worth noting. Uh, because, you know, pretty important that we make connections back to our, <laughs> our essentially our, our book of Genesis for, for um journalism films um okay i got two more points here lorraine and maynard's wedding on the beach i thought this was really cute albeit maybe a little bit um not out of place but just like i said like a tonally defunct like version of what we're trying to deal with i didn't necessarily like the wedding as much as i liked the conversation between monk and his brother played by sterling k brown i thought that was important um and the rest maybe felt i don't know just just fine yeah I, I thought it was a powerful scene uh, in the sense of like you know we walk in monks with his mom and there's just two guys there in their bathing suits it's like okay what's going on but then all that connection happens of like oh sterling k brown's like oh shit mm-hmm. i forgot this is happening right now i can't i gotta go or monks telling him that he has to go but then the couple is actually like getting married is like no like stay we want you here and he's like, I don't want to be a burden. He's like, you can't be a burden. You're family. And I think that was like an important message for Monk to take away from this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, we see all the fun and stuff like that. And then, like you said, that conversation between them is like just so powerful. Maybe the most powerful part of the movie. And just like, just people want to love you. Like, let yeah. people love you. And I, yeah, I think maybe, maybe that's the scene that you know gets him that nomination, and deservedly so. It was a powerful scene between the two of them mm-hmm. yeah i couldn't agree more it's there's often so many times whether when you're getting in an argument with somebody and this is a little bit of a different situation but that's all very much how i watch movies is like how can i relate this to an experience that i have had or i understand and there's so often where you get into it with anytime you get in a heated discussion with someone you can kind of forget um and it's something i've I've learned too, you know, with agents of fandom and we have this such an, such an incredible team. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I, my coworkers are also some of my very best friends. And, it, and sometimes when things get heat, when, when things are getting heated, it's tough to remind yourself, you know, do I want to be right? Or do I want what's best for the team right now? Like, yeah. do I, what is more important to me to prove my point 
to prove why my, why my point is valid and why my point is correct or to listen and to help get the best situation for, for everybody involved. Um, and that to me was something that Monk struggled with a little bit at times was it was kind of more important to him to tell everybody like what's what, as opposed to just, you know, with his family, just be there, just listen, just experience um, and, and take people for what they are and let people take him for what he is. I think this is where Sterling K. Brown does get the nomination. I think this is, this is like kind of this, this amalgamation of, of scenes, Ben, you mentioned, of course, kind of prior to the wedding. And then we get the, the speech at the wedding. Sterling K. Brown is like fucking jacked in this movie, Dude. by the way, unreal body on yeah. that guy. Totally ridiculous. When he first is swimming in the pool and Monk's like, you got to get out of this pool and he gets out or he stands up or whatever. I literally paused the film and I was like, how is this guy so jacked? It's unreal. Um, I went to see the movie like the same day that it came out, that it was like Sterling K. Brown wants to play John Stewart, Green Lantern and James Gunn's DCU. Too. And then I'm watching this movie and he's just so wildly yoked. And it's like, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, him up. Do it. Let now him do I whatever the fuck he wants and put him on my screen. Yeah. yeah. Incredible <laughs> stuff. Last one here. Um, I have kind of the, the final ending scenes whatever you want to call it, where the award is, is given out and Monk essentially accepts the award for fuck winning the literary award for the best, mo best uh, book of the year. And then we smash the black and then we get these few different alternate endings where Monk is like rewriting the finality of the third act with Wiley. And again, some really, Tongue in cheek, smart meta commentary on again, like this this hearkening to like a black exploitation era of um this this is um how he would write it for his audience, and then this is how a different person, namely a white person, would write it for their audience, uh, and different types of how we would say they play out. And then we kind of get this final scene that we see play out, which is a big shootout um, and <laughs> Jeffrey Wright gets shot and like he, he dies. Um, the death of Monk, I, you know, I, however you want to analyze the, the, the final moments here and what that means for maybe where we're at in the world with movies and books and content and whatever it may be. Um, I think it has a lot to say, but I don't know. I thought it, I thought it was inventive, but I also, I thought it was a tad like grading at the end to like try to get through like three different alternate endings. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it, again, that just led to the meta nature of it all where it's like, give us the ending. That's going to be the most exciting, whatever, um, whether or not they, they worked. I just have to say like, he is just one of the coolest nicknames, like to be called monk because your first name's Thelonious is pretty Sick rad. Like, fuck, yeah. That's a pretty fucking cool nickname to have for your entire life. <laughs> like just monk, like, uh, it's so rad. But yeah, uh, the, the meta commentary on it, I thought was, it was, it was interesting for sure. Then them driving away off the lot and things like that. It's like, yeah, I guess this is kind of just how the industry works for better or worse. I, uh, everything you guys said, but I think there was one other thing I felt added on, on top of that with the sort of final ending chosen was to me, it wasn't just, you know, the death of Monk, it's the most exciting, but it was also kind of metaphorically the death of Monk's ego. This was finally the place where it wasn't important. The most important thing to Monk wasn't to prove his point and to be right. Mm -hmm. It was just to do what's best for him and his family. And it didn't really matter how it net it, how it came across in the end as long as he was getting what he needed to get out of it um and so that was kind of the other uh thing i i had it in there at, in there and how it concluded but i i'm with you ethan it kind of pressed on a little long i think that's interesting because i i think i interpreted it like opposite of you where i thought it was actually him um kind of um like basically laying down what he wanted to do and the things that he found important in his life in order to accept this kind of new wave of like, let people love you for who you are and like, come help take care of your mother and like be around family and all of these things. Those things led to the death of his integrity and the death of who he, who he believed he was as, 
as an artist and a writer and the things that he saw as culturally relevant and important to put out into the world. Um, both, both of which I think are accurate readings. And I think that does go to show like the depth of, again, like this commentary that this movie does facilitate. Um, but yeah, it, it, it it was a good, it was an interesting ending. I feel like it was a, a little bit much, but it was an interesting ending. Um, for me, my true cinema moment is when he's first writing his book and we kind of do get that live action play with, with Keith David there. And I thought that was the most well-rounded aspect of the film. Yeah. Mine is one TJ talked about already. I just, I love the line delivery of like, it's really important that we listen to black voices right mm -hmm. now as they just completely ignore the two <laughs> black voices in the real, like it's like, that's actually really funny. Um, but I also just, I do love that beach scene when they're spreading your ashes. Like it's that pretty good. So funny. <laughs> it's, it's great. Yeah. The, just like Ben, Benny mentioned there, the, um, the, that scene with the listen to black voices, but then also for me, the, um, sort of showdown, I like to call it between Issa Rae character, Issa Rae's character and Jeffrey Wright's monk. That was probably my favorite moment of the movie. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good moments. I unfortunately don't think it surmounts to like a whole great project. Um, but I think it is uh it is deserving of a best picture nomination. I do think it rounds out quite a good 10 for this year, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um even even if it is my least uh liked one out of the whole bunch. Um now we're going to talk about a category here with this movie that I think is interesting and not one that I thought we'd be tying to this film. Of course, every episode here, we talk about a different Oscars category um, and use our best picture nominations, kind of a bridge to talking about this. This week, we're going to talk about the best original score race. Of course, we've got American fiction uh, by Laura Karpman. We've got Oppenheimer from Ludwig Goranson, killers of the flower moon from Robbie Robertson, poor things from Jerskin Fendrix and Indiana Jones and the dial of destiny tj i think it's interesting that you're on for this one because uh, of course indiana jones is more of an ip base which i think is kind of like more your bag where where are you at on dial of destiny and more importantly where are you at on it getting nominated for original score because i've got some thoughts but i want to let you take mike for a sec I don't think this is indiana jones and the dial of destiny um like so I got to be careful how, how I word this next one because I have lots of Swifties on the Agents of Venom team and I don't want to get any anybody mad at me. But I think Taylor Swift is such a big mega figure now. Like she's obviously the most uh, famous person in the entire world. And so because she had an album come out, she won the Grammy for best album of the year because she's that big of a deal right now. You know what I mean? That's kind of how I felt about her Grammy win of album of the year this year. Not saying she didn't deserve it. Of course she did. That's why she's such a big deal. Um, but it was almost like, a, Oh, Taylor Swift came out with an album. Well, we bet we got to put her for album of the year, right? This is not an Indiana Jones and the dial of destiny. Uh, best original score uh, nomination. This is a, Oh, John Williams came out with a score this year. Therefore, we have to put him in the category. Yeah. Um, that's what that's what this one was with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Um, it does feel weird that it got nominated for something. I'm kind of of the I don't rate it as poorly compared to the other Indiana Jones movies as a lot of Indiana Jones fans do, because I didn't grow up watching them. I watched them all as an adult. I didn't have any uh, I didn't have any childhood affiliation to Indiana Jones. So each one is equally ridiculous as the last to me. Time travel. Cool. Wow. They've bad, done. Bad they've done a bunch of. I'm, and I love all. Of them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're like ridiculous in a bad way. I love my ridiculous okay. movies. But I'm saying like time travel is not necessarily any more of a crazy thing than any of the things they've done in the past, whether it be aliens, whether it be ghosts, regardless. Um and so the movie itself, I definitely don't think it's it's Oscar worthy, but I think John Williams's name is what got that in the Oscar conversation. I'm I'm pro Dial of Destiny. Let it be known. I, I actually think it's quite a good, good film uh, into the Indiana Jones uh, franchise. And I do like the time travel element and everything that that means for Indy as a character. Um, ben, this is a, this is a really big moment of truth because now uh, two and a half months ago, I gifted you a, a lovely Christmas gift of all of the Indiana Jones films on Blu-ray because you, because you hadn't seen them. And I was like, here, I want my friend to experience some really good movies. And 
Have you seen him? No, I have not. <laughs> I have not. Uh, someday, once when we do the Indiana Jones draft, we'll, I'll get around to it. Um, Killing me. I know. I'm sorry, but yeah, even without seeing it, I, it seems kind of obvious. This is a John Williams nomination, you know, like than yeah. the actual film itself. But uh, I mean, some great nominations here. I think you could have slid in Spider Verse in one of these spots. Oh, that's a big stub for this one to me. Right. Like I think that could work here and you know, anyone that knows or listens, whatever past lives, my favorite movie of the year, but mm-hmm. I would love to have seen that score in here as well. I thought that was really good. I think, uh, I think it's really funny that we keep perpetuating this, um, this conversation because I think the boy and the heron absolute snub in this category, um, because Joe his, his, should have been nominated for this for this score uh for the boy in the hair and i know you guys haven't seen it um it is sublime truly sublime and so while i understand the john williams of everything it is equal parts infuriating and disappointing because i thought the academy was like actively trying to take steps away from doing that and from being like ah uh, hey there's somebody we like that we know uh aka annette benning like mm-hmm. let's just give him a nom um like maybe that's not always the best thing to do. You know, maybe it's cool to broaden our horizons a little bit. And even if it wasn't the boy in the hair and if it was past lives, if it was across the spider verse, it was something else. Um, I think that would have been better. Um, I'm not saying John Williams here is like not worthy of a nomination, but like zero people walked out of dial of destiny and was like, that is one of the best five scores of the year. Nobody <laughs> said that. And nobody was being coaxed to say that nothing was ever going to come of that. So I think it's exceptionally startling that that made it in here. Um, American fiction. And we kind of touched on this. I don't think it has a, sh- a shot. I, I mean, this is, this is Oppie's all day and yeah. twice on Sunday. Like, I don't even know if we're having a conversation here. Yeah. I mean, I brought up my pitch for Robbie Robertson uh, with, you know, winning posthumously for mm-hmm. Scorsese, but this does feel like it's Ludwig's to win without a doubt. Couldn't yeah. agree more. It's 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 in the bag there. The one thing I'll say about American fiction score is I did feel like it was with very uneven at times, sort of choppy, intentionally choppy pacing. This movie had the score did a very good job of almost spoon like spoon feeding is not the right word, but like pointing you in the right direction of how you were supposed to be feeling in these certain scenes as they heavily changed directions so mm-hmm. it wasn't necessarily a great score and uh in the terms of like wow when they with that needle drop was so incredible you know but it was more of like a, it did a good job of pointing you in the direction of how you were supposed to be taking in and and uh listening to certain scenes um and then yeah i couldn't agree more on the dial of destiny i i'm with you i'm pro dial of destiny I, I, I don't think anything in this movie is more ridiculous than anything in past Indiana Joneses. And I love ridiculous movies. I love the Fast and the Furious <laughs> movies. And so I'm with you. I, I'm a Dial of Destiny truther. I'm an apologist for it compared to most people, I think, with how it was critically rated. But it shouldn't be in an Oscar conversation. That's a different conversation. <laughs> It's a good, that's a good take right there, DJ. Hold on to that take. It feels good to hear you have a good take. Um, I, I think, I think the only thing in competition with Oppenheimer would be Killers of the Flower Moon, but I honestly think that would be a huge upset, upset in this, in this category here. Um, I'd be, I'd be shocked if, if that happens. Um, considering Killers of the Flower Moon picked up a best original song nomination as well, it, to me, it feels like the Academy saying, "Like we know, look, we know Oppenheimer is going to win all of these, all of these categories. Let's get out, get some more nominations for Killers of the Flower Moon. Put Scorsese back in those double digits and goose egg him again. Hopefully not, Lily Gladstone. Fingers crossed. But like, you know, um, it just, it just feels like we kind of know what's what's coming down the pipeline here. Um, American Fiction score. I thought it was, I thought it was good." I thought it was fine. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's some other things that I would put in this category uh, overall. But um, yeah, any any other thoughts on American fiction? Any closing thoughts? Any thing that you didn't get to share? I mean, we covered how Jack Sterling K. Brown is. That was my big takeaway from the yeah. second rewatch. Like, oh, damn, <laughs> that dude is dope. He's unbelievable. I'm curious what his workout regimen is. 
Like you think you think on a, he's on like a no carbs protein only like working out three times a day situation here. I think there are certain people who just have a little bit more natural ability to look a certain way than others do. But I still also I don't think it's necessarily like it does. It could be, but I don't think it has to be like a no carb go full pedal to the metal situation. But I would bet you it's a planned meals working mm-hmm. out two to three hours a day type of thing. If we ever get Sterling K. Brown on the pod, that's our first question. What's your workout routine? My guy. Hear it. Yeah. Give we want daily know. routine. <laughs> I got to know. Um, TJ, thanks so much for being on the pod, man. Um, a pleasure to have you here talking about American fiction. Uh, if people want to find more of you, where can they do that at? Um, right on the screen here. If you're watching us on YouTube, TJ underscore is Warch five. You can find me right. Oh, oh, wrong finger. Oh, and there it is there right it is. there. TJ underscore is Warch five. Um, and more importantly, follow the agents of fandom on socials at agents fandom on Twitter and TikTok. agents of fandom everywhere else. Uh, the website is absolutely popping each month lately has been our new best month ever. We're up over 10,000 followers on Facebook. And so that's been going crazy over there. Um, and, uh, you get to see amazing articles from our wonderfully talented team, including Ethan, who anytime he goes to a festival, he just <laughs> fires off, yeah. uh, Dude, articles again. like it's, uh, absolutely nothing. That last stretch, uh, you had after, uh, <laughs> what was the last Sunday? Was that online Sundance? Sundance? Yeah, man. Um, that was one of like the wildest article writing streaks I have, <laughs> I've ever seen, uh, in terms of getting those out. So that was incredible. Uh, make sure you check out agentsfandom.com. We cover everything from film uh like film critique like ethan does on these type of movies all the way through um you know fast and the furious rankings and the most ridiculous moments in the fast and the furious franchise uh so total opposite spectrums of uh of movies with superhero and comic book stuff with gaming with anime with uh all these different things so make sure you check it out the website's always got something in, no matter what your fandom is yeah, absolutely. Lots of good South by Southwest content coming to the coming to the website in the next uh, few weeks here. Next week on the pod, we're trying to figure out who left Snoopy in the vestibule. It's Maestro time. I can't believe it. Woo! We that better be our shortest it. episode. This better be our <laughs> shortest episode. I have a Do it you won't see be. how excited I am just announcing that we're talking about Maestro? You're gonna have to live with this for like 80 minutes next week. Oh I God. haven't seen it yet, and I know for a fact I'm going to hate it just because of oh. how excited Ethan is about it. Like, I know so that fired this up. is going to be the one that will be my least favorite of the Best <laughs> Picture nominees Here, just because of how hyped up Ethan is about it. Here's the thing, though, is that I've already started forming my defenses because I know this movie has problems, and I'm not oblivious to those very glaring issues, but... I choose to love the movie regardless. So my arguments, I will have them written down. I will be prepared. I will have closing statements, opening statements. I I will come ready to explain why Maestro is better than everybody says it is because it, it really is. Um, but I don't have to rein it in next week. I'm not going <laughs> to rein it in anymore. Um, I'm not going to rein it in. It's going to be Ugh. great. I'm so excited. I can't believe. So I... fucking hyped. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, all of you keep me in your thoughts and prayers and let us know what awards you think American fiction will be picking up at the Academy Awards. If any, um, we'll be winning best picture again. Like this is, that's a, that's a tough hill to climb on that one with this movie for sure. But let us know what you think on Twitter and Instagram. We're at 24 minutes of eight twenty four. You can also find us on YouTube where you can watch us talking about these movies. Thank you everybody for your support. We really appreciate it. I am Ben Lawhorn. And I'm Ethan Simi, motherfucker. 